Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Van Buskirk, and we're going to be talking about the alterations in respiratory function. As you know already, there are several different kinds of lung sounds. Um, when you have normal or within normal limit sounds, you just hear air going in and out. Um, <clears throat> listen to yourself breathe when you're healthy, and you'll understand what normal lung sounds are. Crackles are a common sound um, that you'll hear, especially when there's CHF, some kinds of pneumonia, anything where there's fluid overload for any reason, you will hear crackles. And that is like um, little bubbles popping in the small airways of the lungs. Then the next one you might occasionally hear is ronchi. And ronchite is um, fluid or mucus that's in the larger airways. You're going to hear that right across the sternum and just to the sides of the sternum. The, um, sternum. They're low pitch sounds, continuous. Um, you hear them more on expiration. And sometimes they're very audible. You don't even have to have a stethoscope to hear them. Wheezes, if you have anyone in your life that has asthma, then you've probably heard wheezes. But wheezes are like if you take a balloon and fill it with air and then you pinch the end of it and let the ear out, you'll air out, you'll hear that ee sound. And um, you can hear them on inspiration as well as expiration. Usually you hear them in all lung fields quite often easier to hear on the top. Crackles you hear at the bases of the lungs. Crackles are a teeny tiny sound, so at the bases of the lung there's teeny tiny alveoli. Ronchi is a large sound, so that's a large tube. And then wheezes are the obstruction of the tube. So again, think of the um, um, squeezing of a balloon. And then a pleural fiction rub is um, it's when the lining between the lungs gets inflamed and you hear this leather on leather sort of sound is the best way. It doesn't clear with coughing. Um, it's usually heard the loudest uh, over the, the front um, towards the bottom. And people who have a pleural friction rub are pretty darn sick. So you all know what hypoxia is. It is the lowering of oxygen level. And think about how do we identify hypoxia? What do we see? What do we hear? What um, kind of labs are involved in hypoxia? So when you think of that, you will think of um, breathing very heavily, putting a lot of labor into bleeding. That's what you'll see. The blood pressure might rise because that's the body's way of um, protecting the vital organs. If the blood pressure rises, it's hard to shunt um, blood to the to the um, peripheries and it stays more in the heart, lungs, and trunk. It's really kind of miraculous how your body works when it does compensatory mechanisms like that. The blood vessels increase, um, like I said, and then you'll see confusion, restlessness, high anxiety. Um, a person who's hypoxic, usually at the start of hypoxia anyway, is quite anxious. As hypoxia continues, that's when the confusion sets in and eventually um, delirium and, um, you know, God help them, death. Uh, we certainly don't want that to happen. So what drives the oxygen hypoxic drive? And the answer to that basically is CO is um, carbon dioxide. When your body is not excreting carbon dioxide like it should, or not pulling it in like it should, um, the, the higher level of of carbon dioxide is what causes you to think, oh, I need to take a breath. <gasps> you take a breath, <sighs> you blow it out, life returns to normal. So you kind of know the basics of hypoxia. You know the basics of fluid and electrolytes. We've talked about this many, many times. Um, but let's talk about ABGs. Here is an ABG chart, and you're going to want to know this because, first of all, it's going to be on the test. It'll probably be on, it'll definitely be on my test. It will be on the boards. There was always an ABG question. Excuse me, my dog is barking. I hope it doesn't bother you. So pH is, stands for the power of hydrogen. 
and hydrogen is the atom that controls alkalinity and acidic, acidity in your blood. And remember when you're looking at ABGs, you are looking at the arterial blood, not venous blood, not what you do regular lab work out of, not what, um, you know, comes out of the IV, whatever that might be. We're looking at arterial blood. And arterial blood, an ABG, is usually drawn from um, the arteries and the wrists. So a normal pH, the normal power of hydrogen in your arterial blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. The closer to 7.35 and lower than 7.35 is acidic. 7.45, or the closer to 7.45 and on up, is alkalotic. Um, PaCO2 is the percentage of CO2 in your blood, and you want that to stay between 35 and 45. When it goes lower than that, again, the person could lose their respiratory drive and become very, very um, acidic. And when it becomes higher than that, they can become very alkalotic. HCO3 is bicarb, and think of um, baking soda. Baking soda is nothing but bicarb, and um, your body, believe it or not, <laughs> uses uh, bicarb a lot to maintain homeostasis. So you want the normal bicarb level to be between 22 and 26, and then the CO2 level should be between 80 and 100. Now this is the uh, um, CO2 level that's in the blood. So it's going to be different than the SAO2. SAO2 is your pulse ox, which you are familiar with. Put the little thing on your finger and um, you have um, a reading that you want to stay above 95 depending on the patient. PA means partial pressure of CO2 or O2 in the arterial blood. So how much is in there pushing the serum around is what that means um, in a very generic term. So this chart is really cool because it explains to you, it's a mnemonic, and it explains in very, very common, easy language how arterial blood gases work. So if you look up here, you have acidosis is when the blood, um, again, when the, the um, pH of the blood goes low. Alkalosis is when the pH of the blood goes high. And um, when the, the PaCO2 rises, you're going to have respiratory issues or respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis. And when the bicarb rises, it's metabolic. So I think this is pretty easy to understand because when you look at CO2, all you have to think about is CO2 is a gas. Gas is respiratory. When you think of bicarb, think of baking soda. Baking soda is something that you can feel. Um, it's not something you breathe in. So it's very easy to remember that it's meta metabolic. Now, this is probably the most important tool you're going to need for figuring out ABGs. And this is the only tool you're going to need as far as this class is concerned. As you go on in your education, you'll see uncompensated, partially compensated, and compensated. Please don't mess with those right now. In fact, we're not even going to talk about them, so don't worry about them. And I know some of you get all hung up on that, but please, that is an advanced nursing skill that you do not need to worry about right now. What you do need to worry about is how to identify whether a patient has respiratory acidosis or alkalosis or metabolic. And here's the, ac the um, acronym to remember it, the mnemonic, Rome. Respiratory opposite, metabolic equal. Write that down like a hundred times somewhere. And here's what it means. If you are suffering from respiratory alkalosis, your pH will be high and your CO2 will be low. So you see how they are opposite? pH high, CO2 low. All right? If someone is acidotic, 
then the pH will be low and the CO2 will be high. You always, when you're figuring an ABG, you always want to consider the pH first, then look at the CO2, then look at the bicarb. Okay? So respiratory opposite. pH is high, CO2 will be low. That's alkalosis. pH is low, CO2 is high. That's acidosis. Now, ME, the second part of Rome, is when you determine whether it's metabolic. Metabolic means equal, which means the pH and the bicarb are going the same way. So if your pH is high, your bicarb will be high and you'll be alkalotic. If the pH is low and the bicarb is low, you're acidotic. So if I were you, I would write out this chart, like I said, memorize this chart because it really does simplify ABGs down to their most um, simple. Okay, so now let's talk about some reasons for respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So it's respiratory. Respiratory opposite, metabolic equal. So respiratory acidosis, that means our pH is low, so our CO2 will be low. Causes are hypoventilation, uh, COPD, different kinds of pneumonia, and any kind of disease process that involves the central nervous system. Respiratory alkalosis <coughs> means the pH is high, so the CO2 is high. Hyperventilation. This is where you give somebody a paper bag. You don't give them oxygen. You give them a paper bag to blow off some of that CO2. People who have pulmonary embolisms quite often have respiratory alkalosis. You see it a lot in CHF, asthma, and again in pneumonia. Pneumonia can take you either way. Okay, now let's talk about metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Remember, respiratory opposite, metabolic equal. So in metabolic acidosis, your pH is low. So your bicarb is going to be low. It'll be lower than 22. Causes of this are usually diarrhea, chronic real, renal failure, and starvation. And I try to remember this, the whole diarrhea thing, because that's probably where a question might come from. Um, I always think of rest, uh, pH is down, bicarb is down. If you have diarrhea, you're sitting down. Do I need to go any further than that? With metabolic alkalosis, you have too much bicarb. It's too much is, is retained. Your, um, uh, your kidneys aren't excreting it like they should. So you have high pH, you have a high um, bicarb, and the causes are usually GI suctioning, vomiting, diuretics, and hypokalemia. So the way I remember this is high pH high bicarb. When you vomit, that's higher than if you have diarrhea. Kind of silly, but it really does help you remember things well. So we're going to, in the next video, I'm going to talk more about disease processes. So um, again, make a chart with the Rome acronym and the PHs because I do want to do a couple of problems for review and we'll certainly be doing some in class.